wintry it becomes. Um, tonight we welcome Catherine Parker Heath, who is the Community and Conservation Archaeologist um, for South <coughs> Park in the Peak District National Park. Um, and now I'll hand over to Catherine to talk about Vale Night. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just to clarify, I am currently a Community and Conservation Archaeologist with the Peak District National Park Authority. And um, up until June this last year, I was the Cultural Heritage Officer with the South West Peak Landscape Partnership Scheme. Next time they have to have a shorter, shorter kind of version, I think. Um, and, um, and, and this evening I'm going to talk to you about uh, a project that I was involved with, Understanding Dale Mine, as the South West Peak Cultural Heritage Officer. In that role, I was delivering two projects, the Barns and Buildings Project and the Small Heritage Adoption Project. And the Understanding Dale Mine Project was part <coughs> of the Small Heritage Adoption Project, even though it wasn't that small, really, <laughs> in the end. Um, so, Dale Mine. Well, it is uh, an 18th and 19th century lead and zinc mine, and it is situated near Warslow, here's a map, on what is now the Peak District National Park's Warslow Moors Estate. Now, this um, Warslow Moors Estate used to be the Harper Crew Estate, and the Peak District National Park kind of uh, accrued this in lieu of death duties a few decades ago. I think it was the 1980s, it was. There is, is Warslow Moors Estate that once belonged to the Harper Crews, and the Harper Crews, you may know, have their seat of Cork Abbey, which is in southern Derbyshire. Um, the red bit in the middle is the area of Dale Mine. And you can see that it's um, opposite, I've got my pointer, there we go. There's Dale Mine, and you can see opposite it, down here, just be below it to the south, is Ecton Hill, which you may know is the site of Ecton Mine, which is uh, a copper mine that's been mined since the Bronze Age and owned by the Dukes of Devonshire, um, Chatsworth Estates on this, on this side here. Um, now it's not following. <laughs> Let's try it with this one. Somehow it seems to have lost its connection with what I'm doing here, but let me just try that again. Yes, there we go. Okay, there's Ecton Hill, taken from uh, Dale Mine uh, across the, the Manifold Valley. And you can see that Dale Mine is, is somewhat literally, as well as metaphorically, overshadowed by, by Ecton Mine. Ecton Mine, you've probably all heard of it. It's quite famous, it's quite well known. The proceeds are, from that mine are said to have built a present in, in Buxton, and, and <coughs> so on. Um, when I started in my post as South West Peak Cultural Heritage Officer, there was a, an email waiting for me. And that email was from Dr. John Barnett. So I don't know whether any of, of you know of him or have heard of him, but he used to be senior survey archeologist with the Peak District National Park. And he retired about five, six years ago, maybe more than that now. Okay. Um, but he, he, there was an email there waiting for me all about Dale Mine and about how he wanted to do some work there in his retirement, basically. Um, he had been quite involved and has been quite involved with Ecton Mine. So, and, but he always understood that Dale Mine had a great deal of importance as well. And he said that, I think in one of the reports he's actually written, that if Ecton Mine wasn't there and Dale Mine was situated somewhere else, or you know, one or the other, then Dale Mine may have received more attention than it had up until, until this point. Um, I think he was just waiting for my project and the funding that was available to do it. But I didn't really know much about Dale Mine at this point. This is a picture of Dale Mine from the edge of Warslow Village. This is actually from a site where there was a barn that we were, we were working on as well as part of the barns project called Hobcroft Farm. And um, that's looking back across to the site of Dale Mine. You can see that we've got quite a fair bit of lumps and bumps, earthworks, old quarry sites, all kinds of things going on, and this structure down here. Some years previously, so I think this is in 2015-16, uh, 
John Barnett had done an underground survey in Dale Mine that was in April 2015 and March 2016, and so they'd done a survey of the underground remains. I don't think I would fancy doing a survey of underground remains of a mine, uh, <laughs> to be honest. But, um, <coughs> but you may know that, that John has a particular soft spot for the, the history and archaeology of mining. Um, so he enjoys going underground. And this is the plan of the workings that they produced from that survey. So you've got the entrance down here, what they call a pumpway here. These are kind of working. Some of these are natural cave um, kind of formations. Others are pipe workings. And the pumpway is basically the way to get water, uh, pump water out of, of the mine. So it's, it's, in, some words, it, in some ways, it's like a sough. Um, but it was always also used as a way for the miners to get down, to walk into the mine as well and get down to the workings. And this is what we call a schematic elevation of the mine, so you get a bit of an idea of the levels. And this, I suppose, in, in some ways it's unusual, is that the, the lead, the veins, the, mater the minerals were going down at around about a 45 degree angle, basically. Um, everything from the pumpway, the pumpway is still accessible now. I mean, not that, like you can just go down there and walk along it. There is a, there, it was blocked off and then that was kind of opened and now there is a lockable gate on it. But I, there is a way that you, as far as I know, <laughs> that you can go in with permission. Make sure you, you've got permission and you know what you're doing. Please don't all go and start going to lock down. Anyway, this is still open, but everything below this pumpway level now is underwater. And this is one of the thing, you know, the problems, the issues that beset this mine through the whole of its, <coughs> whole of its history, the water. The pumpway comes out uh, further along this way, just above the level of the Manifold River. And then you've got Ecton, Ecton Hill on the other side. Now if we go back to the plan, so we can see here that we've got this footway shaft which is the way that um, the miners went down, not initial, initially, but at some, a short while after. And we've got here an engine, engine shaft and chamber. So can you remember this? Because this is directly underneath the main engine shaft, and we'll be talking about that a little bit and show you where that is from the surface. And then here further along, there is what, what seems to be an abandoned engine chamber where it was intended either for a for some kind of water wheel construction thing to be fitted there, or some other kind of mechanical. Anyway, the, the machine was never fitted there. It was never put in there. Um, this was a hydraulic engine here. And whilst there's nothing remaining of it, there are lots of slots in the walls. And John did a survey of that to try and understand better how the, how the machine kind of fitted, fitted in there. Apparently, there is. Um, uh, an engine that looks like the one that was here in the museum at Matlock Bath, which was taken from a mine at Winster. Okay, and then back to this one. So this is just to show you that going back, this is the footway shaft. So there is kind of workings here, but then this goes to this footway shaft, and you can, you can see the little ladders, they're quite mm -hmm. sweet, aren't they? I like the <laughs> the little ladders come down. Um, and this is the main engine shaft, and then this would come down to the engine, um, the end, which you can't, because this is a, a section, you can't see the, the depth of that, the, the um, engine the hall, no, it's not hall, but you know, <laughs> um, the space where the engine was. Oh. <coughs> okay. So in the years in between, John doing this underground survey, he then was quite uh, focused on Ecton Mine across the valley. Uh, uh, you might know there was some restoration work done there, done there, and there was a submersible that they put down in the in the layer in the in the water that was meant to be have all this kind of artificial intelligence that was meant to learn and be able to record things and then hopefully make its way back, which I believe it did. I've just, um, there are a couple of articles in the ACID magazine, which is, I don't know if you, you, you know about this magazine, the Archaeology and Conservation 
um, archaeology and conservation in Derbyshire in the Peak District. Um, so it was known as acid. So I've brought quite a, um, a, well, a big box of acid with me this evening. Um, but there is an article in here by John Barnett on, on Ecton, and there's another one uh, in the more recent one too, one talking about the restoration and one talking about the Sid Musical. I have brought a few copies of the Acid magazine from the, from the past five years, um, so please do take a copy with them. The box is really heavy. I don't want to have to carry it home. So please take, you know, if there's not enough and you want more, just let me know and I can make sure that some get here for your next meeting anyway because I've, we have got quite a lot uh, around and there's a new one, a new issue coming out very soon as well. So those are those. Anyway, uh, back to Dale Mine. So John had been busy with with that. So, so it's kind of coming back to when I first got started to get involved with this project. Now, people, it wasn't just John that had shown an interest in Dale Mine before, people before him had, and you may know of um, Lindsay Porter and John Roby. There's this book here, which is, was printed in 2000, and they talk a lot about a lot of the, the um, copper and lead mines around the Manifold Valley, so they do talk about Dale Mine in here, and they did a lot of the historical research, and it was, John was kind of building on that. Um, they, there are, so there are, there are historic documents, there are documents that give us some of the historical background to Dale Mine, but they're, they're rather patchy. So you have kind of summary accounts in the mining journal from around the mid 19th century, which kind of give us some idea of what was going on, what was being built, what buildings were there and so on. But you also have to be a little bit wary with these because these tend to have an optimistic view of the mine and what was coming out to try and get the shareholders, I think, to not panic and also to give more money to the ventures. So there had been a lot of historical research done, but this, this kind of research had focused on the history and the people and so on and so forth. John wanted to come and see how this could fit with what we could see on the ground, the archaeology, the remains that were there. Um, so, oh sorry, just to say that this is the kind of brief history. So it started being worked in the late 18th century. We know there were some kind of references, vague references, but we know that it was definitely in 1766 mining was going on here already. But we don't know quite when it started. And then you can see I've got these eight companies or groups of individuals that try, try their luck, if you like. They come and they form companies over time, but they're relatively short-lived. And they're beset with problems, and a lot of this is to do with the cost of maintaining the mine. And that's a lot of that's to do with the cost of pumping the water out, out of the mine. If you can remember that, that vein was going down, 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 under, under the level of the, the river, filling with water and the cost of trying to keep that out so you could mine, just it outweighed the profits that, that people were making. Um, and it has been said that the, the, the ore that was coming out of Dale Mine was really good quality as well, but it's almost like that just a few months in each of the years that these companies were working, they were actually making a good profit. You know, most of the time it was just trying to stay afloat, kind of literally, I suppose, with all that water. <laughs> Um, it was mainly, um, for, the, for the most part, it was lead they were mining. And then, I don't know whether it was just so much that they realised that there was zinc as well that they could use, or whether the technology to, to retrieve the zinc changed, but it was basically, the zinc wasn't really worked until Melville Atwood came along in 1854 to 1856. And this reworking the main hillock becomes quite significant for the rest of my talk and the Dale Mine project. Uh, but basically, he kind of started digging into the, the spoil. So this is the hillock from the spoil from the, the lead mining to kind of rework it to extract the zinc from it. Because this is not working properly, I can't see what slide is coming next. You see, because I'm making my excuses. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's that one. Okay. So, um, and already my notes have just 
gone by the side, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick them up when I need to check something. Okay, so this is a this is a map a close up of Dale Mine. So this is the the OS map, kind of a version of the OS map, and on it um, you can see this structure. You remember the photograph across the valley, we could see that it was a structure there. This structure here is described as lime kilns disused here. And then you've got word kilns disused. But you've got all kinds of things. Those are the main kind of lumps and bumps, but they're all over the place, really. Um, whilst people have been unsure exactly what this structure was, I think pretty much everybody who'd been to look at it were pretty clear that it could not be lime kilns. One of the reasons was that it had wooden lintels, wooden frames, wooden bits to it, and no evidence of burning of any kind. So, you know, wooden things are not very conducive to, to a structure that's used for burning anything, really. Um, and um, I'll just look so there. Porter and Roby um, also recognised that this, they couldn't be lime kilns, and they suggested that they could be all bins or filter beds obviously something to do with the, the ore processing, or buddles, or something something like that. Um, and this does feature quite heavily in the Understanding Dale Mine project. We'll come back to that. But the first thing that John wanted to do was to do a surface survey, or a survey of the surface remains at Dale Mine and see how they corresponded to the underground survey that he'd done. And so he went along here with Nigel Sharp and a Southwest Peak volunteer, Peter Neville, who had a kite, a special kite, not just, you know, to go out, and, but although it would be a quite a good spot to go flying a kite. But he took his kite to take aerial photographs. And these are some of the, that's one of the aerial photographs that he, he took. Um, and so this is the structure down here. It was quite insignificant from this, this view, actually. But this is the structure, the supposed lime kiln structure. And then this is kind of going upslope. And then you've got all these workings here, the main workings. And then, you know, beyond, there's all kinds of other lumps and bumps. And this is the result of that survey. Uh, I must say at this point that all, all the plans and the drawings that I'm going to show you this evening are all done by John Barnett as part of the, the survey and the excavations. And the photographs I'm showing you are from various people, myself, John Barnett, and a number of the volunteers who worked <coughs> on the project. Um, so just a few things to show you here. So number 11, this is the, the structure. I'm going to call it the structure in a kind of um, foreboding voice until we reveal exactly what it could be. So, um, anyway, um, so this is the structure. Number one here, this is the main engine shaft, which is directly above that big en engine chamber. That's the word that I was looking for before, chamber, uh, not hall. We have um, a, a horse gin. Winding whim. A whim, I think, is a Staffordshire term, and a gin is more of a Derbyshire term. Um, we have the site of a possible other, sh other shaft here. Uh, this is the footway shaft, I believe, down here. Uh, we've got roadways, routeways, and we've got all these other features around and about. We've got here is up here is like a, 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 a double reservoir, if you like, which would have fed one of the, the steam engines, which would have been here, one of the winding engines. Now, the next few that I'm going to show you actually are colour-coded to make it a bit clearer. So these, these yellow features, these are all the pre-mining features that are on the site, and these correspond basically to medieval lynchets. So from that medieval period when it was used for agriculture before before it was known that there was any ores there that were worth mining before anybody started. Then this one, it's very colourful. We have the, the green bits are the, well, it's described here as the pre-pumping 18th century mining, okay, before there was deep shafts dug into the ground. And then we've got the late 18th century mining, or the remains of what was the 8th century, 18th century mining up to 1854. Then the yellow are all the remains of the 1854 to 1873 mining. So this is after um, 
Melville Atwood kind of got his hands on things. Um, and then there's some bits that are uncertainly dated, various bits and pieces that could be shaft or little quarries, stone quarries and so on. Um, and this just corresponds to show that the, the early workings um, are shallow workings, so they're kind of surface workings where the star seems to follow like a vein going to the saw pit vein here. Um, and then I suppose it's a realisation that what you're trying to find is going deeper and deeper underground, so you start to, to follow it. And these are the, the quarries that have been identified as quarries. So in the sense of it, where it looks like there's a lot of things going on, you do have a lot of quarrying, which we imagine where it was where the stone came from that built various buildings that we know were on the site from the historic document. And we have... Um, quarries there to get limestone. We've also got lime burning complex. So of course we do have lime kilns in the vicinity and of course that needs limestone to be, to be burnt. Um, and this is a photo of, a, I think it's kind of been described as a double lime kiln. It's like one on top of the other. Um, and that's in where it says lime burning complex up here. Now I do just have to make sure I tell you as well that in, in around about 1862, they moved the main shaft um, from here up to about 200 metres north, and they sunk another shaft there to try and find veins that were close to the surface so they could get away from this problem with, with the flooding. Um, that wasn't part of the survey because it wasn't accessible, basically. This area here, and like I said, it's on the Warslow Moors estate, there is a public <coughs> right of way going past it, and it is all access land, so you are free to go and have a good look at, good look around. And this is the surface survey superimposed onto the underground survey. And you can see that you've got the main shaft, which is directly above the engine chamber had the hydraulic engine there for a time. Um, the red are the accessible underground workings, and the um, the yellow is all of those that are now below, well, have always been below level level, but now flooded and inaccessible. So just some, some photos of what it actually looks like on the ground. So this is the main shaft. That's what it did look like with this fence. It looks a little bit different now. Um, this is what what's known as the upper dressing, dressing floor. Um, so this is where they brought ore out, and this is where it was dressed. These around here and over here are the sites of where there were boiler houses. We've got records of a smithy, of a carpenter's shop, of a boiler house and an engine house. And over this way, we've got all that quarrying. If you remember, the plan was all that quarrying. That's where the stone came to build some of these buildings. So that is all here. And that's looking at the quarries there. And then this is the, um, the horse winding whim. And this is the, the reservoir. So you've got one kind of area here, then you've got uh, a separation, and then the other over here. And of course you've got Ecton Hill looming in the background, and there's the, the late 18th century engine engine shed, engine house up on the top there, and with the, the balance cone, which you can see quite clearly on Ecton Hill. Um, this is the lower dressing floor, and this is the structure. So it doesn't look very much from this side, but that is what it looks like from the front. Okay, so you perhaps can see why they might somebody might have kind of interpreted it just at face value as, as lime kilns. Um, so after doing the survey, so the survey happened in 2018, John was keen to go back and do some more invasive exploration, so excavation. Um, it also came, became, oh, that's the looking down on, on the structure. We can kind of see that there are these chambers at the back of it. 
the structure, let me just go back to this one, um, it, the whole structure has six openings and it's, it's unusual and there's no, nothing like it at any other mine site in the UK, apparently. Okay, I have to take John's word for that. Now I know you can see, only see four openings there. There are a couple of other chambers up this side with two openings and they're quite different than these four. They are larger and set back a little bit more. So a question was, did they all have the same purpose and were they all of the same date? That's looking down again from the top. Um, and this is one of the, the entrances, the holes to, to it. And you can see that what we've got here is the, the rubble core, <coughs> all the facings being robbed. And here you can see that it looks, starting to look a bit unstable. What you've got here, this is this, is this wall here, and then you've got this slot, and then this other wall on the other side. So it was clear, too, that as well as excavating, it also needed a bit of TLC. It needed a bit of care and attention. And it was quite important to give it this care and attention whilst we were excavating as well to stop it all collapsing and falling on our heads. So we decided that we would um, work with um, a, a heritage professional, somebody. So we've got John. There's John Barnett here. And this guy here is called Mark Womersley, who, who is, is very experienced in working with historical structures. He works with lime mortar and traditional skills. He puts on a lot of workshops. And he also analyzes lime mortar. He does a lot of that for a lot of um, historic building projects to check that people are using the right lime mortar mix. So we, we got together and we went to the site and we had a chat about what we wanted to do and how we were going to do it. Thank you. They were thinking very hard and seeing what we could do. And um, we decided that we could do something. It was feasible. We had a budget. We worked it all out. And then we, we needed help to do it. So um, we needed a workforce, if you like. And I, one of the things that I was doing as South SP Cultural Heritage Officer was working with a lot of volunteers. So I had a lot of people that I could call on. So we, we put on a walk and a talk and invited volunteers to come along to try and, try and encourage interest I think. Uh, and these are some of those volunteers. Let's see if you can recognise anybody in the audience. That's a, um, all listening to John as he talks about what he wants to do. And we went as well with Mark when he took some lime mortar samples and helped him do that as he talked through the process of what he was doing. And then he took it away and analysed it and said, OK, this is what we kind of need to to do, we need to mix it in. Before we started digging though, we also wanted to do something called geophysics. We wanted to um, kind of investigate a little bit more what was under the ground, at the, on the surface, not, not the mining, but on the ground to see if we could find the remains of any of the foundations of the buildings that we knew about from the historic sources and what some of the surface survey had had suggested to us and some of these wonderful volunteers that I work with also come with their own equipment and <laughs> special skills <laughs> they're being very quiet over there I get my pointer so this Richard and Angela over there they, they they basically came with their own resistivity survey and we did a bit of training with some of the other volunteers and um, there we go you can't recognize him now because he's got a mask on <laughs> but um we, there was a, yeah, a few volunteers were very interested. They did the training day and uh, then they went out on site and to do the survey. This was me spying on Richard and Angela from across the valley. I was working on the barn this day and then I said, I can see those people over there. So um, you, I didn't tell you I'd taken a picture. I don't think you're actually doing the resistivity though, though, are you? you in You've got me doing nothing again, haven't you? No, I've got a great one of you doing nothing. <laughs> coming up. <laughs> um, so they went and they did the resistivity, and this is the results of that. Now, you may know that a resistivity survey measures resistance. It sends an electric current down into the ground, and it measures the resistance, and that produces you know, anomalies, if you like, black and white picture. 
and um, they did that down here, which this is the lower dressing floor. And there was nothing there that could be interpreted as, as archaeological notes, even though you can see anomalies. Up here, however, there and here, there's a different story. I don't know if you can see, we've got these sub-rectangular bits. Can you see this here, where it comes around and up? So it's very light in the middle, and you've kind of got this dark framing around it. Can you see that? So that indicates the presence, the foundation of a building. And we have a similar thing up here, which kind of, that's missing because that's the shaft, of course, that we didn't go across there. But you can start to see something that's coming up around here as well, uh, which is kind of a, a strange thing because it's not on the alignment, the orientation that you would expect around this shaft. So that's a little bit of a, a curiosity. But it was decided that when we came to digging into the ground, we would concentrate on the structure, but only part of it because of time and, and funding kind of restraints, and not and because of the big trees as well up this end, uh, that we would just concentrate on two of the chambers where there's two entrances. We would excavate the whole of the front of it though, and we would also put a little trench up here to see what this was here. Now John was assuming that this was the, um, the wall of one of the engine houses and it's a special name of a wall and the name is escaped me. Pardon? Bob. The, the Bob wall, so the thicker kind of more strengthened wall so you know that kind of can well stop the engine I suppose the event like toppling into the, the shaft. Um, takes the weight of the balance. Takes the balance, yeah, takes the weight. <coughs> um, so that's where we decided to dig. Now this, this trench here is a small one. It's, no, it's what we say in archaeology as a trial trench. It was just to see what was there and whether it was worth going back and doing, doing a bigger excavation in the future. And this is just to show some of the, well, the survey so the, the A is the structure, which we could see, the lower dressing floor, um, the, the one, like one of the platforms where we think the bob wall was, the shaft and the upper dressing floor. The, the, the G here and the F is those sort of rectangular anomalies from the geophysics. And then the, the blue uh, is from, well, actually it's the, the M and the O no, sorry, the blue, the L, whichever order they come in, H-I-J-K-L, <laughs> um, are referred to buildings that we know from the historic sources and where we've kind of approximately located them from that because they did ha sometimes have plans, but they were very schematic and kind of unreliable. So we know that there was this kind of building there in the late 1850s or something was there but we don't know whether the plan refers to just this, these two up here, and you can see how different these, these two are to the rest of them. So we don't know whether it's just referring to these two or the whole thing, because it's that, you know, it's not, it's not accurate, it's just a, 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 a summary sketch. Um, and then the O <coughs> and the M and the N, I believe, relate to later kind of structures buildings that we know of on the site from the historic sources. So there we go. We've got trench one down here, trench two up here. So on, I think it was August the 16th, 2019, we started the dig. And they had something like around about 20 volunteers overall taking part over around about three weeks. Um, we had an open day. Now, before you start any excavation, you kind of record what's there before you start. Um, and that is what it looked like. That's a, a, a survey of the structure before we started digging. So we could see certain things like the entrances, which we, we could see went into whatever these chamber type things were. And um, we could see part of the wall, we could see where the wall had fallen down, bits where there was the original facing here, um, but where all the facing had been rubbed on these, these front parts here. And we could see bits of 
the walls and where they were, they, you know, split into compartments. So we started work and we set, up, set out, first of all, to remove all the rubble from the front of the structure. And, and we did this as, as what we would call archaeologically as a watching brief. So it wasn't carefully excavated, it was kind of quite quickly removed, barrowed, mattock, shovels and things. A lot of this was slump in front of it. But John was on hand to check that nothing archaeologi archaeologically important was destroyed or damaged. So he would shout stop if, if he'd seen anything and needed to go more carefully. I don't think he did shout stop, did he? Because there wasn't very much there apart from it was just all this slump. But you've got the stone as well. Which was, which was saved because we needed it to help consolidate the structure. Um, and then we, well, we, I keep saying we, actually. I, I was kind of overseeing this, but couldn't get my hands dirty very, very often, to be honest, or at all, really. So I just went to check how they were all getting on every now and then. Crack the whip. Um, pardon? Crack the whip. You crack the whip, yeah. I did, the whip did not need cracking, but anyway. So people worked hard doing the lime mortaring, you know, clearing out the old bits of mortar, um, tidying it up, putting the new mortar in to make sure it was, it was secure. And we did this from the bottom, and as we went up, we then needed the scaffold. And there's a nice picture of Richard doing nothing, having a rest, <laughs> looking across at the view. It's, like, it's okay, we do let people have rests, <laughs> rest breaks <laughs> when they excavate. Uh, it is, of course, pretty hard work, you know, hard labour. Um, but you can see that we got down to the original surface of what the structure was built on here. And there we go, people doing the line mortaring. Oh, who's this? You. Who's this? Is that you? Yeah. yeah. And a few more pictures of people working pretty hard and as you can see when we started excavating behind behind in the chambers you can see we had a, a, a partition wall between these two um, which we suspected and we kept on going and consolidating as we went along so this is consolidating these bits so that as we went deeper they weren't falling on on top of us Bit more, a few more action shots, and we excavated also the front of the the, the structure, the entrances. Just, we'll come back to the structure in a moment. Just to go to trench two for a moment. Um, this is trench two. You can see it's quite little. It was what one meter by three meters, I think, um, and it was pretty disappointing, really that it, it was the site of the bog wall of the an engine shed, but it had been pretty much totally robbed out, uh, which why it, it didn't have the high anomaly as some of the other things on the, the reductivity survey. Um, there's the plan and the section. So these are all things that we produce when we do an excavation, a plan of everything and, and sections give a greater understanding of what's going on. Um, but back to the structure. So this uh, here is tank two, I believe, and the top layer in both tank two and tank one was general rubble and rubbish. So it had all kinds of, of finds in it, like bottles, late 19th century bottles. Did it have a HP sauce bottle in it? Marmalade kind of? <laughs> Bottles, you know, d dateable things as well that could be dated, you know, I think something could be dated to like 1905 and so on and so forth. I think, I believe that there was also a burial of a dog, but I wasn't there to see that. Were you there when they excavated that? Which seemed quite sad. What, did you rebury it somewhere? Yeah, there's something like that there, yeah. Yeah. Was it, did we reckon it was a dog or a fox? I can't remember. I was going to go for fox, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, I thought. We didn't <laughs> check. No. Okay. We left that with John. <laughs> Where is it now? It's nice. <laughs> um, Backed up, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, consistent with that kind of late 19th century, early 20th century rubbish dump. And I think it was clear as well that rubbish had been brought elsewhere and dumped, dumped in here. It was kind of a convenient place to put things if you don't know what else to do with it, I suppose. Um, 
then underneath this that layer, this is the top of it. So that's oh, this is the the top of the next layer underneath that rubble and rubbish layer. You had a layer of a, a kind of smallish um, limestone chips, if you like, which was a, a layer of about I think around about fifteen centimeters deep. Oh, this is what I need to look at my notes because I can't remember. Um, and it was the same in both. Now, it wasn't the kind of stuff that had come out of the mine. There was no ore kind of associated with it. There was no bits of ores or anything like that. It was limestone, limestone um, chippings and bits of sandy, <coughs> sandy gravel. And that's the, the plan of the top of that, that layer. So this is underneath the rubbish layer, the top of the next layer. And you can start to see other things poking out. I mean, if you've noticed in some of the photographs, we've got a brick wall running along here. We have a dry stone wall top, which was blocking the entrance. That was starting to show. And we have this vertical slab top starting to show at the very top of this, this layer. Oh, and this pipe that went a certain way out of this wall here. Um, then underneath, let me just go out. Underneath this layer, then there was a layer, a much thicker layer of clinker, which had come from from the engine, <coughs> what had come from the spoil heaps that had been put there from from the engines up near the engine house near the shaft, and then that was put uh, in there. So it was quite a uniform layer of around about forty five centimeters in both tank one and tank two, and then underneath that you had these bigger stones. And again, this is the same in tank one and tank two. You've got the same layers. Um, and you can see also here that these slabs, or more so, you can see that this is the one, the highest one, wasn't it? That was the one that was poking out of the, the, uh, underneath that, the rubble, rubbish layer. And then you've got others poking out here. And you can see that they've got holes at the top of them. And of course, they're roofing slabs that have been reused. Now, there was much pondering about what they were doing there. And of course, pe people, as you're excavating, you're excavating slowly, you can see that they're there. So the temptation to kind of move them and say, probably was really great, but you, you're not allowed to do that until you're at the right time. So I think there was lots of pondering about what they could possibly be used for. And then eventually came the great reveal. And they were covering over the ends of pipes. Oh. I need to not press it too hard. So they were covering on to the end of pipe. So this is in tank one. And um, you can also see that they were covering the end of pipes in, it's a bit okay. Now let's see which slide we're up to. Don't look to see how many there are, because you'll go, oh my God, she's got what, 77 slides and we're only on number 10. Um, okay. We're down here, aren't we? Yeah. See, 53 slides you've sat through already. Mm -hmm. And you've all still got your eyes open. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, okay. So you can see then that these pipes were going all the way through from tank one, well, tank one to tank two, or tank two to tank one. And you had these roofing slabs, um, stone tiles, if you like, on on both sides there put there very deliberately for a reason what that reason was we weren't sure in the clay pipes there was a bit of like clay sediment on the bottom of them of these and again we can see that this like uh, tank two had a dry stone wall blocking up the entrance which had been put in which we assume had been put in later and then you've got the the brick wall, this is the edge of the brick wall, which you saw in one of the other plants. <laughs> there we go. And then the, the bottom of both of these, these chambers, these tanks that we started calling them, you've got paving slab. So this is the very bottom of it. Paving slab, you have a little bit of kind of a skim of a, a clay kind of substance on the which was interpreted as that they'd been swept out. When they'd been finished being used, at some point they'd been swept out and cleaned. 
these were largely sandstone slabs, but there were a couple of limestone slabs in there. And that's a picture of it. And all that's after we've moved all the, the roofing tiles here. And this dry stone wall actually is, is not the original one. This is one that we put in when we finished actually to stop stop people or animals or children climbing back through into the into the chambers. That's the original bottom of the dry stone wall after we finished the excavation so before we built it back up again. So this is um, a plan, kind of extrapolated plan of what we think it was like before we found it in the state, well, before it was ruined. So we've got the two tanks at this end, and then four tanks down this end. And these are the two that we excavated. We excavated all these openings here. Uh, and that's why you've got the detail there. There may be similar kind of details in the others, but we don't we don't know because we didn't excavate them. Now, that's kind of where we got to with the excavation. So how did this help us kind of decide and interpret what they were? Were they orbins or buddles or settling tanks or, or something else? What were they? Um, and before we started, I think after the survey, John had kind of quite a clear idea that he thought they would be ore bins. So there's a kind of where you put part processed ore from the top dressing floor. He thought that then you would bring it down to the bottom dressing floor and re, you know, process it further. However, that kind of idea, as well as with buddles, you would expect there to be a sloping floor um, and kind of a chute. I think that's what you get at Ecton Mine, where you've kind of got a chute where you've processed ore and it comes down to a lower dressing floor and you bring it out and you do more crushing and more washing and that kind of thing. This, these have very flat floors. And the interpretation that John settled on, was <laughs> settled on, sorry, was that they were settling tanks. So you had ore being processed on the upper dressing floor being crushed and then washed in, in buddles to allow the, the heavier ores to settle down as the, as the water and the, the mixture was poured into the buddles, it would settle down onto a sloping channel, if you like, and then the, the liquid would come off. But from that, you, get, you do get a liquid, but it's kind of a sludge, a slimy, sludgy sludge. thing, sludge, slimy, <laughs> sludgy sludge. <laughs> okay, that's the technical term. So John's supposition was that then this was kind of more water was added to this, put in these settling tanks to allow that sludge to fall and settle, then the water drained off and that sludge taken out on the lower dresser floor to catch more ore that was missed. So that is the interpretation. However, that doesn't explain all those different layers that we have exactly the same in tank two and tank one. So we think that it had an original purpose as settling tanks, but then a secondary use as filter beds that probably relate to a period in the 1870s when there was a lawsuit against the, I think it was the New Dale Mine Company at that point, um, by, I think it was Swainsley Hall, the owners there complained and was taking them to court because they were polluting the river, basically, and killing the trout and stopping the trout fishing. So they had to do something. However, this seems to have happened just a couple of years before the whole mining operation ceased and it closed down and nothing was happening. So we don't, we're not sure whether it was ever used as filter beds. John kind of recognised that there wasn't a lot, an awful lot of sediment in, in these layers. There was lots of cavities, lots of holes. So it seems like they, either were, they were used, it was used once or twice or never used at all as filter beds. Um, and and it's, there's still quite a lot of questions about it. I'm just going to go through some of the, the, the other kind of um, strange things that have not been explained yet. So. We have this, where the, the pipes are coming through. So we, we're not sure what the pipes would have been used for, how it operated. John's very keen to be able to go back and excavate the whole thing to try and get more answers to see whether we've got a similar thing happening in the other, in the other chambers. 
The pipes are play pipes, but they're not made for this purpose. They're kind of industrial kind of <coughs> pipes that could have fitted together. And on the other side, um, I don't know whether we've got a picture of that actually. <coughs> I don't think we have, but on the other side they've got lips where they could have been joined together to create a long, a long pipe. But what you've also got is, is Portland cement, which is quite well rendered down here and thickly applied and kind of comes very flush with the end of the pipes in tank one. Makes it look like it was all that's all contemporary, but the, the render, the Portland cement render, could kind of be hiding things behind it that show us that they may have been different, done at different times, different phases. Um, the Portland cement is all the way up the sides of the, the tanks, but it gets worse as it gets to the, the top. It's kind of not applied as carefully up here as it is down, down there and came off quite, quite easily. And of course, this, this was all over the the brick wall. And of course, we've got a brick wall, and that in itself suggests that this is not contemporary when the, when the structure was first built, but this is an addition, an addition to it. Um, we've got wooden lintels. There's evidence of bulkhead doors that we've got, which suggests that they would be, you know, holding water in there. Um, and lots of interesting questions. And there's Hugh again. There's, there's the wall. And you can see that the... Well, the wall is made of handmade bricks, but they're not of great quality. So the Portland cement, which is very hard, uh, is kind of, as that's come away, it's kind of brought the brick away with it. <coughs> oh, those are the lips on the other side in tank two. You can see how they protrude from this side. And that's where, on the other side, that's a really bad photograph, actually. I didn't realise it was so blurry. Um, and then here's a section of the whole thing. Now, what became clear also was that there must have been a phase where, an original phase, where this was the outside wall here, coming down here, and then this bit was added later. And one of the reasons why we think that is because in tank one, where there was that pipe, I don't know if you remember, going back to that, there was a pipe just above the entrance, and that went so far out here, but then was blocked by the building of this outer wall. And this here is a clay slot. So it's filled, it's a slot between the two walls, and it's filled with clay, suggesting that it had some waterproofing kind of purpose. And here are all the, the filter bed layers. You can see those you know, quite clearly in section. This is the rubbish rubble layer um, with the foxes and dogs or whatever it was in there. And then you've got these layers that are consistent with what filter beds were known to be like at that, uh, in, in the late 19th century. There's a picture of the slot. And um, how far, this is showing how far that original wall came out, well, sorry, not the original wall, the, the additional wall, which is the front of the structure now, came out. So we only had in a few places the original facing wall, if you like. Most of it had been rubbed away. But there you can see that down at the bottom. And then all the rest has been rubbed out. And that's just to show you again how that's how it would have, you know, extrapolated how far it, could, it would have come out from there. So given a lot of extra support and a lot, a lot of extra strength to what was going on behind it. So there are phases have been extrapolated now, suggested. And one suggestion is that phase 1A was just when these two tanks were built. We've got a phase 1B where these four were added. Presumably at this point they are being used as the settling, settling tanks. And then phase 1C is the addition of this. So maybe it was, it was you know, seen that actually we do need a bit more support. But what we've got here is the clay slot only runs so far up to here. So we really don't know what the purpose of tank 5 or tank 6 was. There is some suggestion that the different tanks were used for different ores or different grades of ore or even different working gangs who needed to, you know, almost like, I suppose, on commission, you know, of, of the kind of ores that they were getting out but nothing is entirely clear. 
And then phase two, the blue in here is, is, is suggestive of, of the phase when we used as filter beds. But again, we're not sure exactly what they were intended to filter. Because by this point, if you remember, I said that they'd sunk another shaft 200 metres over to the, the north of this site. So there was very little going on around this area. So were they really pumping water out up from up there and bringing it all the way down here to filter? If they were filtering water from the pumpway still, from the workings, if anything was going on under here, why do it here and why not do it at the entrance or the exit of the pumpway just before it got to the river? Because it would ex you know, take away the expense of having to pump it up to surface. There is some suggestion that maybe it was filtering sewage from the village, but it's quite a, a way from the village. Um, so it's, it, there's, there's lots of unanswered questions. And, and I suppose that's the way it is with most excavations. You, know, you start and you throw up more questions than you actually answer when you, you set out. Um, just to show you, that's the section showing you the phases there, the, the seam phases. This actually shows the pipe that was going from tank one and how far it went in, you know, and then it was blocked, completely blocked off. So the inner wall and then we've got the outer wall. And that's a, a photo of it again. And um, a table showing the projected phasing. And of course, you can see lots of question marks by everything. <laughs> so the only ones that haven't got question marks are um, a, a 1B and a 1C, which is which is because it's quite clear that the outer wall was put on after the inner outer wall, you know, the original outer wall. So that's the only thing that we can be really certain of. Everything else is just trying to make sense of, of what we found. So that's the before photo. That's the after photo. It's quite a difference, really. Um, that's the before photo looking at the back and the after photo showing, showing the two tanks. And the new fencing around the shaft, because the old one was not very um, secure. We had been told that um, the, a land manager, or a land manager who was the Moors Estate many years ago, used to, I think it was, it used to park his Land Rover at this spot because it was nice and flat. But underneath is, is basically a mine shaft that's very deep and it's got rotten timbers and bits of rubble on the top, but otherwise it's not, not blocked up, not very safe at all. And, and since then we have recently had, um, oh there's fencing around the Albans, that's the stuff that cattle and people falling in. And we've recently had a plaque mm. installed upon there, so if you do go and have a look then you've got a little bit of explanation to remind you of everything. I've just been talking to you about this evening. Um, I've, I've kind of come to a stop there, but I do want to say that I have I have the the survey report here, which has a catalogue of all what all the the, um, the features are. I've got some of these laminated survey plots as well, and uh, I have the excavation report too. They have glossaries in as well. If you want to check what some of the terms mean. Um, I also have this just a little bit, this is kind of the, the the summary of the phases and the character of work and it's kind of historic things. You're free to take one of those if you want to. Please do take the Acid magazine copies of those. Um, and also I have got some leaflets for a, a barn trail around the Wars Low Moors estate as well. So feel free to take one of those and, and maybe go up and have a wander around. I would say it's probably best to do this in the summer when it's quite dry, because it does get very wet up there. But that, that takes in Hobcroft Bar, which is the one where I took some photos from I mentioned, which is on the front of the leaflet. And that's been restored, and you can go inside that and have a look, because it's got a lot of original features in it. Just have to promote those things too. <laughs> Okay, so that, that I've come to the end there, really. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. I'm not a technical expert on lead mining, but I can answer as best as I can. <coughs> and we do have, I think, three people here who actually worked on, on the site, so they can 
maybe it helps us some things too. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you.